Hey, 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 happy Tuesday. Come on in, pull up a chair. The Gaming Gang Dispatch is in the air. Howdy, gang, and welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang Dispatch, brought to you by, insanely enough, thegaminggang.com, of which I happen to be the founder and editor-in-chief. So welcome aboard. Tonight is Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024. This is live stream number 1,040. So if you're not overly familiar with this show, let me point out super, super casual around here. Just hanging out, talking about the latest in tabletop gaming news. And then I will usually pontificate about some subject having to do with our hobby. Tonight, I will be discussing can any other role-playing game, both current or upcoming, hope to knock off Dungeons and Dragons to dethrone d and I will get into that a bit later. But of course, first, we will be talking about the tabletop gaming news. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more you are not going to find here on the channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Con. Then, of course, because this is a live show, there is chat available. It's not on screen. It's one of the ways I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. And you must be a subscriber to the channel in order to take part in chat. But if you want to say howdy, maybe you got a question, a comment, by all means, chime in. I will do my best to respond. So far tonight, well... Let's see, there's been a few chats that have been going on to this point. Kathy Evans is the first out the gate in this chat. We've got Kevin King, friend of the show, the madman. Yes, he is one of our chat moderators. We also have Jose Fernandez, the wheeling dragon, who I believe might be a first time visitor here in chat. Another of our chat moderators, Flaming Huron is here, as is Chaz, Tessie Trekkie, Roger Prudhomme, Semper Buffo, No Linquister is also with us. I think I've said hello to everyone. Tessie Tracky says they're one of those unusual commenters. And of course, I will take a guess that the lovely and talented Miss Sarah D is possibly lurking in the shadows. Kevin R. Smith is also popping in. So what happened so far tonight? This is a YouTube issue, not my issue. So last week, I think it was actually on Thursday, they had an issue where you could not go in and edit any of your live streams that you set up. So as an example, when I finish up a show, normally one of the first things I'll do once I leave the duct tape studios, is to set up the next show so that when somebody goes to the channel, they will see the next show scheduled. Couldn't do that. Couldn't touch anything. So the way it was set up was every stream was going to have last Thursday's show information on it. So on Friday, YouTube announced a workaround. So I did the workaround. That's why you saw the topic for tonight's show is can any RPG dethrone D&D or Dungeons and Dragons, whatever I have the title as. Well, I go to stream it and it's not streaming it. 
it's telling me I've got two streams. I got to pick a stream. And the stream I continue to pick is like the wrong one. And I'm like, oh, for crying out loud. So I've actually gone through the intro to this show five times. And it was funny. I was about seven minutes into the show because I started right at seven. I was right on the dot. And I see chat and I'm, oh, hey, so-and-so's here, so-and-so's here, blah, blah, blah. And then somebody says, uh, Jeff must be late. And I'm like, oh, for crying out loud. Like the damn stream isn't working. And then I had to screw around with it for nearly a half hour. But yes, we do have the stream up now. Thank you. Steve Bernier is joining us in chat. So a couple of things I want to mention. Well, one thing right off the bat I do want to mention before we get into things is, unfortunately, I have the sorry news to report that Elliot's nephew, Paul, did pass away Thursday night. It was about two hours after I had finished the show. Elliot sent me a text, and uh, he had been in hospice. He actually held on for a couple of days longer than anyone had expected. In fact, I think it was on Monday that doctors were telling his mom that uh, probably wasn't going to last another 24 hours. But uh, yes, Paul Miller has passed. Maybe maybe next week, if I do shows next week, I'm kind of up in the, up in the air about if I'm going to do shows next week. Because I am going to take a week off like I do every quarter. Uh, Kevin R. Smith is sending his condolences. The reality is, and I did point this out previously, I had not talked to Paul in about 25 years. And uh, I didn't have anything against him, but he had some demons that he dealt with. And I guess one thing I can say is those demons are now at rest. So that is that is a good thing. But yes, uh, that's who... As Flaming Heron points out, uh, commiseration to Elliot and his family. That's who my heart really goes out to is uh, Elliot and Elliot's mom and Paul's mom and the, and the whole Miller clan because I'm sort of kind of part of their family. I grew up with them. I mean, they were like my second family. So unfortunately, yes, Paul did pass last week. So yes, that bad news. Okay. So we are going to jump on into the news. I will be talking about if I think that there's a role-playing game out there now or on the horizon that can dethrone Dungeons and Dragons after the news. So let's jump on into the news because this winter we'll see the release of SETI Search for extraterrestrial intelligence from Czech Games Edition. And here is what I know. In SETI, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, a Euro-style game for one to four players. You lead a scientific institution tasked with searching for traces of life beyond planet Earth. The game draws inspiration from current or emerging technologies and efforts in space exploration. Players will explore nearby planets and their moons by launching probes from Earth while taking advantage of ever-shifting planetary positions. Decide whether to land on their surface to collect valuable samples or stay in orbit for a broader survey. Additionally, by directing your telescopes to gaze into distant star systems, you may detect traces of alien signals or undiscovered exoplanets and collect promising data to examine and study back home. Back on Earth, you can invest in upgrading your equipment so that you can analyze incoming data more efficiently, boost your telescope signal capacity, or increase your supply of resources, all to expand the scope of your search that could lead to a discovery of extraterrestrial life forms. You'll also make use of over 200 cards to aid your efforts or focus your research in a particular direction for additional bonuses and rewards. Each card has unique effects and illustrations and depicts real-life technologies 
projects, and discoveries like the ISS, Large Hadron Collider, Perseverance Rover, Voyager Probe, and many more. Finding traces of extraterrestrial life is only a matter of time. Utilize the resources you have at your disposal strategically, and you may well end up being the one to make the biggest scientific contribution towards advancing our understanding of alien life within our galaxy. SETI Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence pays homage to space and planetary exploration, astronomy, the ongoing search for signs of life in the vastness of space, and efforts to understand the nature of life in the universe. SETI is for, once again, one to four players, ages 13 and up, plays in around 40 minutes per player, and will carry an MSRP of $69.95 when it arrives this winter. Looks good. Looks very interesting. So this is going to be Check Games Edition's big, big winter release. I do not know if this will pop out at Gen Con. I know that Check Games likes to do that on occasion, is to get their games out there at Gen Con. <coughs> Excuse me. See, I'm already talked out from the five previous attempts to get this stream going. <laughs> anyway, we tend to see Check Games Edition release games at Gen Con that don't end up hitting stores until late in the year. Kevin King says, SETI, the sequel, Defender from the Aliens You Inadvertently Alerted to Our Presence. Isn't that what Stephen Hawking said? Didn't he say that if there's intelligent life out there, it is not going to be friendly? I'll have to tell you about an audiobook that I'm listening to after the news. I'll, I'll mention it real quick because this is going to be a big, big show, I can tell. But uh, I, am, uh, I will mention it, and it is honestly the most terrifying thing I've ever listened to. It really is. Moving right along, let's talk about some role-playing game news because Free League Publishing, my friends over at Free League, have released an 88-page quick start for Coriolis, The Great Dark, which, of course, the Kickstarter is currently past a half a million dollars in crowdfunding. Well, if you want to check it out, see what it's about, this is going to be for you. In Coriolis the Great Dark, you are part of a crew of explorers ready to venture out into this new universe, the Lost Horizon. You have your shuttle, your trusted crewmates, and a warding guardian in the form of your bird, a strange alien creature that can help you on your journeys. You all have your separate backgrounds and homes in the asteroid metropolis called Ship City. You're employed by a small guild, the Explorers Guild, and are ready to take on the missions they'll give you. Delving into the ruins will bring out the best of you all. You'll have to overcome dangerous environments, face creatures from the dark, and endure the ubiquitous blight, a plague affecting both mind and body. And other crews of explorers will become your opponents as you vie for the same artifacts and knowledge. In the metropolis of Ship City, you may take on missions and investigations to help your guild and build your crew's reputation with the other major players of the city. The 88-page quick start is absolutely free over at Drive Through RPG. So wait. I have reviewed some of the previous Coriolis releases. Very, very unique role-playing game. It does appear that they are kind of abandoning the motif that Coriolis previously had. It, it actually had kind of a Middle Eastern, Arabian Nights science fiction vibe to it. This seems different. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's not going to be excellent. Sounds like it could be pretty interesting. And to be honest, I think Coriolis kind of died on the vine a little bit. 
But if you want to check this out, the quick start is absolutely free over at Drive Through RPG. Matthew Constantine is with us. Uh, he had pointed out, where's the Jodie Foster character piece for SETI? <laughs> Kevin King says, new species blinks in wide-eyed wonder. Why is it so quiet out there? Xenomorph growls in response. We're actually kind of heavy on Kickstarter stuff tonight because there is currently a Kickstarter to fund the second edition of the Rules Light Fantasy role-playing game, Cairn. And I've got the skinny from Space Penguin, Inc. Are you ready to return to the wood? The wood surrounds and divides the realm and anyone or anything that has not yet sworn fealty. The wood is not one forest, but all forests. The root is the realm of mystery and horror underneath and does not care for the petty divisions over ground. Cairn is the drive through RPG platinum best-selling adventure game about exploring a dark and mysterious wood filled with strange folk, hidden treasure, and unspeakable monstrosities. Character generation is quick and random. Adventures are tense and reward careful exploration. And combat is frantic and deadly. The first edition rules are freely available and should be familiar to any fans of Maeve and Into the Odd. The definitive second edition has been freshly revised and developed and includes an expanded player's guide, a brand new warden's guide, and a new adventure, Trouble in Twin Lakes, in a robust and lavishly illustrated box set packed with useful gaming tools. If you're looking for a rules light player forward system for classic fantasy role playing, look no further. Karen Second Edition includes everything you need to get started with a minimum of setup and zero hassle. A simple three stat system and roll under D20 resolution makes it familiar to old school gamers and new players alike, marrying the best of the OSR and 5e mechanics. This project is past the 300% funding mark. You can reserve a copy of the box set for a $55 pledge or score the PDFs for a $20 pledge through April 26th. Expected delivery is March of next year. And you can get your hands on the first edition of Cairn in PDF absolutely free over at Drive Through RPG. Well, well, well. Now, I had, I shouldn't say had, I have the first edition of Cairn, the little kind of zine-sized book. I actually never had an opportunity to really dive on into it. Just, I picked it up. I had purchased it, so it wasn't as if it was sent to me as a review copy. But uh, I was like, uh, oh, yeah, I kind of want that. I, if I remember right, I think I got it. I think I ordered it from Exalted Funeral in an order that I placed with them. So, very, very nice. Very, very nice. I like the artwork, too. The artwork looks pretty cool. Pretty cool. So, if you're looking to save some money, I've got a money-saving offer because the original Fiasco, or as some people like to refer to it, Fiasco Classic from Bully Pulpit Games is the focus of a bundle of holding offer and I've got the deets on the deal. Adventurer! Make your own cinematic tales of small-time capers gone wrong, of disastrous situations founded on big dreams and flawed execution, right out of films like Raising Arizona, Fargo, and other Coen Brothers movies. This resurrected April 2019 fiasco classic bundle once again brings you the tabletop role-playing game you guessed it, Fiasco, its companion, and lots of play sets, plus many live-action freeform games by Fiasco designer Jason Morningstar, published by Bully Pulpit Games. For just $9.95, you'll get all five complete games in this revived offers starter collection, which has a retail value of $42 as DRM-free PDFs. And it includes the Fiasco Classic Rulebook, plus the card-based Civil War role-playing game, 
Carolina Death Crawl, the live action game Radioactive Bison, and the Freeform's The Climb and Out of Dodge. And as a convenience for this offer's customers, fiasco designer Jason Morningstar has curated Jason's favorite fiascos, a collection of seven free play sets. And if you pay more than the current threshold price of $20.82, you'll level up and also get this revival's entire bonus collection with six more games and supplements worth an additional $52, including the Fiasco Companion, the Fiasco Playset Collections Run, Fools Run, and American Disasters, and the Freeform Games Winterhorn and the Skeletons. And for this revival, They've also added Space Post, not Space Ghost, Space Post. Jason's game about delivering the mail across interstellar space. These savings will run through April 16th, and 10% of your payment after payment gateway fees will be donated to Mines Advisory Group. I reviewed Fiasco way back in the day. In fact, it is a written review over at the Gaming Gang. I would say gotta be about 10 years ago, thereabouts, maybe even a little bit more. I remember I liked it. I thought it was pretty interesting. And for a while, it was really hot. In fact, I think right after Will Wheaton did his tabletop episode, in fact, if I remember correctly, I think it was a two-parter where they played Fiasco. I think it really took off. There is a second edition of Fiasco. I've never had an opportunity to see it. Uh, I seem to recall it's available in a box set because I'm pretty sure I shared some news about it when it was uh, crowdfunding or when it came out on sale, either of those. It's a pretty nice, pretty sweet deal. Get your hands on a lot of Fiasco and another aspect of Fiasco, which is very appealing, is there are loads and loads of play sets out there, which are essentially Fiasco scenarios, which are absolutely free. One thing I will point out, you have to have some experience, at least in my opinion, of role-playing games to really get the most out of Fiasco because there are some concepts that you sort of really do need to understand to really get the most out of Fiasco. But it's, I recall it being pretty cool. All right. Flaming Heron says, Fiasco is not such a fiasco. W Forge is with us in chat. No Linquisitor is also joining us once again. I know they were hanging out in the first chat that popped up without any video. So good to see you made your way back to the show. Very nice. All right, final news piece. Yes, it's more Kickstarter news. So I'm going to wrap up with the BX Advanced Bestiary Volume 2 from Third Kingdom Games. A little frog in my throat. I need a quick sip here. That's better. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I shouldn't have tried to, <laughs> tried to do that voice. I hurt a little bit. The BX Advanced Bestiary takes the monsters from the classic basic expert role-playing game and expands them with options and variations. The book is static for use with old-school essentials, but can easily be adapted to other old-school-style games. The book looks at each monster found in the OSE classic rules and then expands them with options and variants. For example, the entry for Elemental adds two new sizes of Elemental, special qualities that an Elemental might have to spice up encounters, and then four new Elemental subtypes, Ice, Magma, Ooze, and Smoke. Right now, this second volume of the series it's going to cover classic monsters E through K, Efreeti through Killer B. The plan is to have the third volume, which will likely be L through P, in the fall of 2024, and then the final volume 
probably will hit Kickstarter about this time next year. This book is largely written. It just needs some polishing, some minor tweaks, and be sent to editing. So this Kickstarter is actually to fund art and printing costs. So the goal is actually to have a, a piece of art for each new monster in the book. This project is over 500% funded. And you can reserve a copy of the print-on-demand hardcover or softcover at cost for a $15 pledge or score just the PDF alone for a $10 pledge through April 10th. Expected delivery is this August. So pretty quick turnaround. And I should mention, if you've been paying attention, I actually reviewed volume one and shared it yesterday. Dun, dun, dun. Because it was a book that someone who wanted to do some reviews for the gaming gang was supposed to review and never did any reviews. Happens quite often. Happens quite often. We'll get people who are like, yeah, I want to review games for the gaming gang. Okay, excellent. Sometimes I get one review and then it's like, well, this is tough. <laughs> or I don't get any. Like in this case. Anyway, once again, this Kickstarter for volume two of the BX Advanced Bestiary runs through April 10th. All righty, that is it for the news tonight. Of course, I was just talking about drive through RPG a few times. Don't forget the gaming gang. Thus, the Dispatch is affiliated with the One Bookshelf site. So if you are going to visit Drive Through RPG or Storyteller's Vault, Dungeon Master's Guild, Wargame Vault, what have you, please stop by thegaminggang.com first. Click on one of our banner ads. That way, if you happen to make a purchase, I get a small portion of that sale. And all those nickels, dimes, and quarters really do add up. Help keep thegaminggang.com around. Also, if you like this video, if you like this video, if you dig the channel, if you find thegaminggang.com to be a valuable resource, hell, if you just like what we do, you can always stop on by paypal.me slash thegaminggang to make a small donation. Hell, you can buy me a two-liter bottle of soda. Yummy. And big thank you to Agile Monk, Kevin King, and Marius Smith, who recently stopped by paypal.me slash the gaming gang and made not small donations. So big tip of the cap to all of you out there who use the banner ads and or stop by paypal.me. The gaming gang. Fleming Aaron says, sponsorship incoming. Oh, well, I don't know about that. Do not know about that. See, if we had had a show on April 1st, I probably would have pulled that gag that I have been wanting to pull for a couple of years, but I, just the way the schedule falls, I do not do a stream on April 1st. It's always on one of the days that I don't do streams because the, the whole gag would be that I would have all these sponsorships, but they would be the same lame-ass sponsorships you hear all the time. Like purple, I'm not saying that the products are lame. I'm just saying you hear these all the time. So like Square Safe and Purple Mattress, Stamps.com. Indeed. <laughs> We're for like the first... 45 minutes, about every 10 minutes, I would stop and do a sponsor blurb, you know? But sorry to say, we just don't get that. No, no, no. All righty. So I am going to be discussing if there is any current or upcoming role-playing game which can dethrone Dungeons & Dragons in just a few moments. But first, I think it's time for a brief intermission. 
It's intermission time, folks. Time out for a delicious snack in our sparkling refreshment building. Every item a fresh, appetizing taste treat. Oh, oh, buy us, oh, buy us, oh, buy us, we beg. For if you don't buy us, we'll bite you in the leg. Now, hold on. What kind of an attitude is that? <laughs> So buy us at one a bundle of charms. And if you don't buy us, we'll break both your arms. Okay, that's enough. Friends, buy the ideal Muppets. The kids will be screaming for them. <laughs> Some people have a deep, abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. People stop pollution. People can stop it. Write for Pollution Booklet, Box 1771, Radio City Station, New York. Did you put a note in that bottle last week? Sure I did. What'd you say? I said, send us more Wilkins coffee. Happy to be back pronto, folks, but right now, here's another yarn for you. There's milk bar one stormy night. The boys are drinking milk with all their might and eating the cereal they like the most. Sugar crisp that's made by folks. When all of a sudden came a terrible din. It's Bart McFinn, a rough tough guy from Cherokee. That's me. I'm a looking for fearless Frank McCall. We're shooting it out for once and for all. We'll shoot all right and I won't miss. But first I'm gonna finish this. As a serious daddy old man, what a treat. Just pour on the milk and you're ready to eat. It's great, says old prospector Fitch. When you dig into this, you're striking it rich. For snacks, it's a handy, says checker champ bread. Post sugar crisp keeps you a jump ahead. I eat it like candy, says pie and a pea. I play with one hand, with t'other I eat. But back to the feud. Mix Frank and McFinn, Frank's eating is done, let the shooting begin. They're reaching, oh glory, the bullets will fly. What's this? Why, it looks like you see eye to eye. A man who eats sugar crisp can't be so bad. When a guy eats this stuff, he can't stay mad. Both sugar crisp made them the greatest of friends. And that's how it is that a story now ends. As a cereal, it's dandy. For snacks, it's so handy. Or eat it like candy. Look for the package with the three bears on it and get Sugar Crisp, one of the newest members of the Post family of cereals. So there's some discussion going on about the famed crying Native American commercial, the anti-pollution commercial. There were a few that actually featured that actor. Now, there's some discussion going on that the Native American was not Native American. They were Italian. I believe you guys are wrong. I think he was a Native American. In fact, for some reason, I think his name was something like Iron Claw. Oh, there we go. Roger Perdome. Thank you. Iron Eyes Cody. But he did have Italian parents. <laughs> well, you know, strangely enough, I've had some friends over the years who were part of Native American tribes, and but they were just like such a small percentage Native American, but they were considered to be part of the tribe. So I was like, oh, okay, all righty. Okay, a few things to tackle real quick. So, the finals for the Gaming Gang March Tabletop Role-Playing Game Madness Finals 
wrapped up on the 31st. Now, you have to keep in mind, I had voting available here on YouTube. It was also on Twitter. So it was super close here on YouTube. In fact, it was so close, it ended up 50-50 between Call of Cthulhu and Traveler. With an even number of votes. So I voted. But it still just showed 50-50. I was like, oh, okay, great. Thanks. Now, over on Twitter, it was a completely different story because Chaosium Inc. shared the tweet. So it ended up being like 75-25 Call of Cthulhu. So Call of Cthulhu won. It is the winner. And I guess if Mongoose Publishing had possibly shared that tweet themselves, maybe it would have been a lot closer. Matthew Constantine says, I tried, Jeff, as much as I love Call of Cthulhu. I think I voted against it almost every time. Hey, I'm the guy who's always got to run it. So, but I also have to point out, if you follow me on social media, I called out Chaosium Inc. today publicly because they released, you might be surprised you didn't see this news piece, the Kickstarter for the Horror on the Orient Express board game launched today. I was all set to share that news. All I was waiting for was sell sheet information because the media kit that Outlet Scott didn't have any write-up about it. There were all these different images. There was a video, had all that stuff, but there was no sell sheet info. So I was waiting for the sell sheet info so I, I could create my news piece. So the project launched this morning. I went and took a look at it, and I got to be honest, not only was I shocked, but I was also pissed because taking a look at that Kickstarter, it's all the same usual suspects that you see on every fucking board game Kickstarter. Every one. Not a single reviewer who, who covers Chaosium Inc. had a video. No one, no one who covers Chaosium Inc. and reviews their products had a video on that Kickstarter. It was, and I am not picking on, I'm not talking about like Dice Tower. Whenever I talk about this stuff, people are already, they're automatically like, oh, just ragging on the Dice Tower. Not at all. I have no issues with Tom Vassell or anybody in the Dice Tower. But I will point out that there are a few well-known shills in those videos. And there are a lot of videos. And I was like, give me a fucking break. So I had uh, thrown a comment out there on Blue Sky. And I got an email from Michael O'Brien from Chaosium Inc. And it was titled WTF question mark. And all it was, was a link to the like post tweet, whatever on blue sky where I was like, you know, not as there's not a single reviewer who actually reviews Chaosium releases as part of that. So I wrote him back and said, hey, you know what? You, you didn't utilize anybody who has been with that company and stood beside that company for years. Some people out there don't recall, there was a time not that long ago where Chaosium Inc. was in the gutter. It was in the gutter. It was on the verge of going under 
because it had been run into the ground and it was delayed on a, like a couple of Kickstarters hadn't been delivered. And Greg Stafford came back to Chaosium and sorted everything out, got rid of people who had been there for too long and were dragging the company down. And I was around back then, and I was pulling for Chaosium publicly. And I was, you know, trying to stick by him, of course, when they were doing shady shit I called him out on it so Kevin R. Smith says yeah they were on the verge of bankruptcy right uh Mike Dymart is with me says I'm glad I was sitting down for this shocking news (laughs) so so anyway so I got an email back saying well you know we offered you the opportunity to play or on the Orient Express on Tabletop Simulator and talk with the uh, creators. And I wrote him back and I said, you know damn well that is not the same as shooting video with a beta of that game, which is what all these people have. So I'm going to tell you right now, I am done with Chaosium Inc., finished. They are now there with Watsy. Because, and the thing is, I had reached out to Michael O'Brien a couple of months back. I sent him an email and I told him, you know, there's a change in attitude with Chaosium Inc. that I am not too fond of. Because it's like, they don't want anything to, they don't really give a shit about the outlets who have been with them all along who've brought them to the dance, who've helped make them the company they are today. I mean, I'm not like trying to pat myself on the back or anything, but there are actually blurbs from my reviews on the back of published releases from Chaosium. But they have now treated me, for the past few months, they've treated me as if I'm some pissant, and it's, I've said it before, say it again, it's their marketing person. They brought in somebody who is another one of those, well, you know, uh, he's an old straight white guy. It's obvious. It is absolutely obvious. So, sorry to say it, gang. Here's your winner, (laughs) who I will be running. And I know people are like, well, you know, they can pay whoever they want to uh, spread the word about their board game. I completely agree. And it's not, yes, granted, it's all the usual suspects who, I don't know about you folks out there, but I get so tired of seeing the same exact people say the same exact fucking things about every fucking board game they they shoot video for. But it's the fact that Chaosium didn't even bother to offer any of the outlets out there who have been covering them and reviewing their releases for years. See, Bernier's asking, am I going to stop playing Call of Cthulhu. I never get to play it. I get to run it. (laughs) Fleming Heron says, I'm sorry to say it's par for the course. Still like Chaosium products. Oh, yeah. I mean, because they are really good. I just reviewed Arkham, gave it a 10 out of 10. Of course, it was like pulling teeth to get a physical copy of that book. It was like, well, we gave you a PDF. It's like, I don't review PDFs. I shoot video. <laughs> Russell Higgins is with us. Good to see you, Russell. Thanks for popping on by. Okay. 
Uh, Kevin R. Smith says, yep, they can totally go to their loyal reviewers and still pay off some shills. Two aren't mutually exclusive. I get it. I mean, that's what, and it's, it's not that they didn't ask me. That's not the point. No, they didn't. They offered me the same thing that they offered every other jack off. <laughs> well, you, you want to you wanna play a demo on Tabletop Simulator? For one, I don't care who you are. I don't play, your, I don't play games on Tabletop Simulator so I can share coverage of them because that's not what I'm going to be playing, you know? Kevin R. Smith says, well, Jeff has an excuse to run something else now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, Seth Skirkowski, I, I know I always get his name wrong. There's no video from him. I mean, he's, Seth is kind of like the, the critical role of Call of Cthulhu. He's the guy who really has brought a lot of eyes onto that game. Nothing from him. I was like, you got to be kidding me. But it was the shills. That's what, to me, that was the backbreaker. When it was like, oh, you got to be kidding. Them? Everybody knows. It's just pay them and they'll say this is spectacular. Anyway, whatever. Whatever. That's their prerogative, but it's also my prerogative to say, how the hell with you? I'm not covering you anymore. Uh, so Chris Lundgren says, Jeff, you as GM get to play. You just play everyone besides one character. I love being a GM. More power to you. I would just like to be able to play on occasion. I have gotten to be a player in a short, like, three and a half hour session twice in the last two years. And that has been one at Gary Khan. The other was at founders and legends. All right. So the topic tonight is, do I believe there is a role-playing game that's out there currently or on the horizon that can dethrone Dungeons and Dragons? And I believe Flaming Heron tossed out are you talking about 5e or just Dungeons and Dragons? Well, it's just looked at as Dungeons and Dragons. So fourth edition was Dungeons and Dragons. This upcoming anniversary edition is still just considered Dungeons and Dragons. So the reason why I wanted to mention this is because two things. Number one, ICV2 recently shared a news piece indicating that Dungeons & Dragons sales were down 30% from the previous year and that tabletop gaming on a whole has stagnated. There was only 1% growth. So that is one reason why I wanted to mention this. Uh, and kind of discuss this a little bit. And I'll give you kind of a long answer, and then I will give you the short answer. So the other thing is that for years, people have talked about, and I've mentioned this before as well, that at one point, Pathfinder outsold Dungeons & Dragons. Now, of course, this was first edition Pathfinder and it was fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons. And that has been kind of the common uh, misconception that Pathfinder outsold Dungeons and Dragons by a large margin consistently when fourth edition was out, which actually isn't true. So let's, let's discuss this. And I'm not picking on ICV2. Although on occasion, they like to post stuff to kind of stir the shit storm, I notice. Which is all right. I, sure, I, I stir the shit storm too. But I do kind of notice that from time to time. 
And let's talk about Dungeons and Dragons sales being down 30% from the previous year. One and and the stagnation, I guess, of the tabletop industry. I guess the only real growth that was shown was in miniatures games. Uh, once again, this is according to ICV2. But here's the problem. ICV2's numbers are skewed because they get their numbers from hobby shops, game stores, retail locations. Not every retail location reports numbers to ICV2. They also don't have information from many online retailers. So, as an example, Amazon. ICV2 doesn't know how many units of D&D releases were sold through Amazon. They don't know. And this actually goes back a long time. This reporting, we're talking more than a decade that ICV2 will reveal numbers. Now I think most of your information is behind a paywall for subscribers who are normally, I think, uh, it's kind of geared towards comic store owners and game store owners because ICV2 also covers comic books. But their numbers don't track the entire industry. Now, I have heard through the grapevine that people who have worked for Paizo and for Wizards of the Coast will attest that at no point in time for an extended period has Pathfinder ever outsold Dungeons and Dragons, even though that story has floated out there for a long, long time. And I guess the reason why supposedly uh, Wizards of the Coast has not pushed back on that story is because they're afraid that it'll sound like sour grapes. Like it's like, oh, no, no, wait, no, Pathfinder never outsold us. They'd be like, okay, well, now you got to prove it. So I guess they're sort of like, meh, whatever. It doesn't really matter. So let's talk about this downturn in the hobby. Because one thing that's not being mentioned is the pandemic and how the pandemic and the lockdowns were a boon for the tabletop gaming industry. There was not a single game company that I was aware of that did worse during the pandemic than before. There was a lot of product moving, and there were a lot of issues as far as the the flow of product yes we know that there are a lot of games that were delayed quite a bit because of the pandemic but numbers were through the roof because people were stuck at home they were either in the middle of a lockdown or they just did not want to expose themselves and their family to outside elements as often as before, and that still continued into 2022. So it wasn't until last summer that we started to see people starting to emerge where it's like, okay, the pandemic is over. COVID is over, which we know is not the case. COVID is still there. It's still out there. It's still a danger. But most people were like, you know what? I'm going back to enjoying my life as I did prior to COVID-19, which is fine. So, of course, what happens then is now they're not buying as much tabletop gaming releases because they're not spending as much time in the home playing games. That's not discussed. That's not talked about. It's more like, a, oh, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. Dungeons and Dragons is down 30%. It's like, what was it? There was a news piece that came out 
few months ago talking about how Hasbro had lost a billion dollars. I think it was a billion dollars. And of course, that was another one that was just making the rounds. Like, oh my goodness, their sales are down a billion dollars. Yeah, because people are moving on from the pandemic. John Harden is with us. So they mentioned they have so much first edition D&D stuff. They have a lifetime of framework and rules guidance at their fingertips. They don't need any new additions, anything like that. They've got their imagination. Kevin R. Smith says the pandemic took two of their three old groups away. They went remote for a while, but didn't like Roll20 well enough to keep going. That sucks. Cal Venoni is with us. Might be... Name's not ringing a bell. No, actually, I think Cal's been with us before. I think last week we saw Cal. Says Wizards of the Coast is their own best, worst enemy. Okay, so can a game dethrone Dungeons and Dragons? The Wheeling Dragon says yes. It could definitely dethrone D&D in their opinion. It's Labyrinth from River Horse Games. River Horse Games has a horrible reputation. <laughs> so, does the Wheeling Dragon own stock or something in River Horse Games? Although I will point out, I have not, I have not played any of their their games. So Cal says yes, I get around. So, what could possibly dethrone D and D? Well. <laughs> I think the new edition that comes out is going to be successful. I don't think it's going to be as successful as people think. Or I should say, as Wizards of the Coast believes. I don't think so. Part of it is that we have already seen them kind of bungle the 50th anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons to a certain extent. The original game plan was to have really the three core books available in a short period of time that would kind of coincide around Gen Con. Well, that's no longer going to be the case. We already know the Monster Manual has fallen back into next year. I would not be shocked if we also see the Dungeon Master's Guide slip into next year. So, right there, I don't think the new edition is going to dethrone the current edition of Dungeons & Dragons. Now, there's the discussion of Pathfinder. So, once again, there's, as we talked about, a misconception that Pathfinder consistently outsold Dungeons and Dragons. Now, I'm not saying it never did. Because if you think back to 4th edition D&D and 1st edition Pathfinder, and once again, I'm pals with people at Paizo, at least up to this point, fingers crossed. They, they don't sit there and go, yeah, that old straight white guy. Uh, the hell with that guy. But there was a point where, remember, Paizo normally comes out with new things every month. And towards the end of the life cycle of fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons, there wasn't a lot coming out. So, yeah, you would think, okay, sure, Pathfinder would be outselling Dungeons and Dragons in months that Wizards of the Coast didn't release anything. You think at least Paizo would have a shot there? Call of Cthulhu? No, I don't see Call of Cthulhu being able to overthrow Dungeons and Dragons. And it's not because I'm sitting there like Chaosium Inc. I just, I just don't see them being able to. In fact, there was, I think it was part of the ICV2 article. It was showing the top 10 role-playing games for last year, and Call of Cthulhu was ninth. And I was kind of surprised. 
I was kind of surprised that Call of Cthulhu was ninth. And once again, keeping in mind that I see the two's numbers, their reporting is skewed. And I don't think they're as forthcoming with that as I think they should be. That it, they, they don't, I, I don't know for sure. Like I said, I don't have a subscription to their paywall content. But uh, I do think that you are kind of looking at a lot more sales on Amazon than people probably think. Uh, because I know for a fact, there are a lot of people out there who still want to pick up the D&D releases, but they have seen that the quality has really dipped on the Dungeons and Dragons releases. So they've waited and they wait till Amazon offers them a pretty good deal. So there is that too. So Chris Lundgren says, Jeff, I call bullshit on this new edition of D&D. It is a new edition. New Dungeon Master's Guide, new player handbook, new monster manual and many of the younger gen first new edition and whining already. It's their first new edition. See, I kept saying that it's a sixth edition too, and then people were giving me a hard time. Oh no, it's going to be completely compatible with 5e. Yeah, that doesn't mean it's not a new edition. And then yes, I do understand. A lot of people were losing their shit over it. And obviously enough, they haven't been around for other games that have new editions come out all the time. Of course, I'm looking at Warhammer 40K and Warhammer Fantasy too, because I, we're getting another old world release. Um, so let's see. So Pathfinder, I don't think Pathfinder could knock it off. I don't think they could dethrone D&D because there is uh, a negative connotation for Pathfinder with, with Dungeons & Dragons players. I don't think that Daggerheart is going to even make a dent in D&D, even though it's created by the eight people who made Dungeons & Dragons cool. Never letting go of that. Never. It's going to be 2028. There we go. <laughs> I'll be talking about the eight people who made Dungeons and Dragons. Cool. Even Wizards of the Coast shooting themselves in the foot. Actually, they pretty much blew their feet off with the open game license fiasco. they still didn't dethrone themselves. <laughs> so I don't see it. I don't see anything out there that is going to replace Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, w. Forge says, what about Tales of the Valiant? That will make an even smaller impact than Daggerheart. So Kevin R. Smith says, Daggerheart is a wild card, especially if Critical Role starts using it for their actual plays. I disagree. They can use it for their actual plays. What they're going to find is they're going to find that their viewership drops because Dungeons and Dragons is in the zeitgeist. There's no getting around it. D&D &D is in the zeitgeist. It's been featured on Stranger Things. It's mentioned in movies, TV shows. <clears throat> and it used to be that if a character played D&D &D or they were interested in D&D, &D, they were a dork. That's why in Stranger Things, in the first season, they're all kind of dorks. They're dorky kids. Because that's how people looked at people, kids, who played Dungeons & Dragons in the 80s. But Dungeons & Dragons is enmeshed in the zeitgeist in a way that no other role-playing game, fantasy or otherwise, is. Now, that's here in the U.S. I do understand, yes, there you go. 
see Bernier's going right where I was pl- planning on heading. Uh, Call Cthulhu is big in Japan. From what I've heard, once again, I don't have hard numbers, but I have heard that Call Cthulhu in Japanese outsells every other language, including English, combined for Chaosium Inc. That is pretty wild. That is pretty amazing. And we also still know that Tunnels and Trolls is a popular fantasy role-playing game in Japan. So yes, I think it's kind of funny that Steve Bernier mentioned that just as I was going to go to that, uh, that Call of Cthulhu, who is hugely popular in Japan. Because outside the United States, yeah, you easily see other role-playing games dethrone Dungeons and Dragons. First of all, to my knowledge, I might not be right, but to my knowledge, Dungeons and Dragons is not available in Japanese. I don't think they, they print a Japanese edition of any of the core Dungeons and Dragons books. So right there, how is D&D going to compete? Then if we take a look at, say, Germany, the Dark Eye is still, as far as I understand, the number one fantasy role-playing game in Germany. It might still be the number one role-playing game in Germany. I don't know for certain. But outside the U.S., yes, Dungeons and Dragons is not as big a deal as it is in, let's say, North America. Nathaniel Cares is with us. Good to see you, Nathaniel. Says, Japan has their homegrown system called Sword World. I've heard of that. I thought there was some talk about translating that into English. That's why I find kind of kind of funny. So there are quite a few Japanese role-playing games out there that are native Japanese role-playing games. They're not real big on translating them to English. It's kind of, kind of funny, kind of interesting. Kevin R. Smith says, then there's Sweden where Dungeons & Dragons never caught on because of Dragonbane, which is Drakar Akdimolar, or however. It's, it's pronounced. Russell Higgins says, the only problem dethroning 5e is availability of games. If you go and try to find a game online, 5e is ahead 10 to 1 in some cases. And Chris Lingren also points out, yes, Dragon Bane is huge in Sweden. And it's fun. I would have run that. That, that was one of the RPGs in the running that made it to... Did they get to the Elite Eight? I think it did. And I was like, well, I wouldn't mind running that. That's fine. Uh, yes, Bernier says the dark eye. Yes, I was just talking about the dark eye in Germany too. So in countries where Dungeons and Dragons doesn't even compete, of course, it, it's, it's dethroned. It's never had the throne. It's never been crowned. But in North America, or I guess we would say maybe the English-speaking world, it has got just a, a crushing grip on the number one spot. Uh, yes, as far as tabletop virtual, or I should say virtual tabletops, it's far and away the most popular role-playing game. Funny enough, I mean, I don't, even though Wizards of the Coast just, doesn't want honest reviews of their products. I don't hate Dungeons and Dragons. I, I wish for success for Dungeons and Dragons. I wish for success for just about every company out there, even ones that I don't like the people or they don't like me. I don't wish anybody failure because failure on a whole is bad for the industry. Success on a whole, is usually good for the industry. 
Matthew Constantine says they live in an area with 6 million people and getting anyone to play something other than D&D or Pathfinder, which is just another version of D&D, is like pulling teeth. Yeah, you can probably make some headway with people who play 5e maybe going the OSR direction or actually maybe more along the lines of new SR. That might work. So we've, we've talked about the long answer. Here's the short answer. Can any role-playing game current or on the horizon that we're aware of be able to dethrone Dungeons and Dragons? And the answer is no. I do not see it happening. And mostly because it is well entrenched. And as I had already pointed out, it is just well immersed into the zeitgeist. It just is in, in ways that no other role-playing game of any genre is. I mean, you talk about Traveler, you talk about Call of Cthulhu. Those are considered very popular role-playing games. They do pretty well for their publishers. But going up against D&D, no. And Pathfinder, I like Pathfinder a lot. You see a lot of coverage of Paizo Inc. here on the Gaming Gang. Unless something happens, then no, I don't see anybody knocking off Dungeons and Dragons, at least in the foreseeable future with this not new edition that's coming out. Somebody else had asked me yesterday if Elon Musk had bought Hasbro. And I was like, not that I'm aware of. They said, oh, they had seen something where it was talking about Elon Musk had bought Hasbro. And I had commented back that I hadn't seen that on any reputable news source. I said, plus, keep in mind what day it is. And they said, oh, no, that, that information that came out on Saturday. So it wouldn't be an April Fool. I was like, still, I haven't seen it anywhere. It's not on CNN. I don't believe it. So I do not believe that Elon Musk has bought Hasbro. Although there has been talk that he should. I know there are people who've been trying to push him to do it. Uh, Daryl Errett is with us. Daryl's been with us for a little bit. Sorry, I didn't say hi earlier. He says, what if George R.R. R. Martin or Brandon Sanderson design an RPG? Well, there was a Brandon Sanderson role-playing game for Mistborn. Didn't do very well. It was actually pretty good. Uh, I'm, you know, weirdly enough, I'm not a Brandon Sanderson fan. Just me. Nothing against him. It's uh, it's just, I can't get into his books. But yes, there already has been. uh, And of course, we do have the Song of Ice and Fire. That is a role-playing game for Game of Thrones, if you want to go in that direction. I guess it's done okay. But they haven't even, you know, whiffed, you know, 10th place, let alone the top spot. So Cal says it depends if you have a good designer or team, then maybe you would have a shot. Uh, Semper Buffo says, what about Star Trek Adventures? It seems popular from Modifius Entertainment. You know, Modifius Entertainment does good stuff. Problem they've got is the 2D20 system. A lot of people don't like it. A lot of people feel it's clunky. A lot of people feel there's too many different kinds of currency to utilize in the game. So don't see that happen. Kim King says, D&D is the McDonald's of gaming. The fact there are better burgers out there does not make it disappear. Just like Dungeons and Dragons is kind of, or just saying D&D, is kind of a, a catch-all. So I've been to Texas a few times, and the first thing that I noticed is everything's a Coke in Texas. Dr. Pepper, you order a Coke. 
If you want orange soda, no joke. I listen to people do this. They order orange Cokes. And it's just sort of like, you know, like Kleenex, right? You can, you can have tissues. It doesn't matter if it's made by Kleenex. People still say, hey, give me a Kleenex. <laughs> you know? So, uh, ShanBot V42 says, in the past, they'd have said White Wolf. We all say, saw what happened with that. Even at its height, White Wolf still wasn't knocking off D&D. The reason why people have such animosity towards White, towards White Wolf is because so many splat books came out and there was only so much room in game stores for role-playing games. So the White Wolf stuff wasn't knocking the D&D stuff off the shelves. It was knocking everything else off the shelves. So that's why quite a few people uh, look poorly at uh, White Wolf. I don't. I picked up Vampire the Masquerade. I thought it was interesting. Never ran it. I thought the Chicago book was pretty cool, seeing I lived in Chicago, and they got a lot of things right because they were in Chicago too. I never really... Kevin R. Smith says they agree. Personally, they dump 2D20's hero point analog and stick with momentum and threat. There was one other thing that I wanted to mention, and now, for some strange reason, I don't recall what it was. Of course, I'm going to wrap up the show, and then I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Kale says, Troll Lord Games with Castles and Crusades is gaining. No, absolutely not. And I, they, I love the Troll Lords. You see me cover Castles and Crusades. I talk about Castles and Crusades all the time with OSR. Uh, but no, they are nowhere in the vicinity. Uh, I would think Castles and Crusades is probably not even in the top 20. If they are, maybe they're right around 1920. I'd like to see that change, of course. But the thing, too, is, got to remember, you can get the core books for Castles and Crusades free. They're not necessarily the latest print run, but as they like to point out over at Troll Lord Games, they don't have additions. The game hasn't changed since it came out. So, yes, there's been some tweaks here and there, different artwork and layout and stuff like that. But the reality is the game itself is the same. So you can get the player's book and the monster book, Monsters and Treasure book, absolutely free. Now, the Castle Keeper's Guide, which a lot of people think, oh, yeah, that's like the Dungeon Master's Guide isn't. It's all optional stuff. So in order to really run Castles and Crusades, you just need the player book and Monsters and Treasure, and that's it. And you can't get both. That's it. Thank you, James Venabush. Which I believe might be a first-time visit. That name's not jumping out. So welcome. Thank you. Now you've reminded me. So it's not a book I'm reading. I'm listening to an audio book. And the audio book, I highly recommend. But as Russell Higgins is calling it a night, thanks for popping in, Russell. It is the most terrifying thing that I have ever listened to. And it is written by an author. Her name is Annie Jacobson, if I remember correctly. I've listened to some other audiobooks from her in the past. This is, she's, uh, she's kind of like a reporter. So the book is called Nuclear War, A Scenario. And it is essentially a second-by-second, minute-by-minute account of a particular scenario 
which leads to nuclear war. And the thing is, this is not a book where it's like, oh, so you listen to the first five hours before anybody's like, oh, I think we're going to launch. No, I mean, right off, right off the bat, it's like the first thing that happens is the American satellites detect a launch from North Korea. And the thing is that this book, the author has interviewed, my God, they, in the audio book, they actually list all the people that have been interviewed. And we're talking secretaries of defense, people who worked at DARPA, Joint Chiefs of Staff, I mean, all just, I mean, top level. And I want to tell you right now, it is fucking scary because it's as close to, it reveals a lot of information that most people don't know uh, that isn't really top secret. It's just stuff that the government does not want you to know about a prospective nuclear war. And there's some stuff that, uh, and the author even mentions this, that comes very close to violating the Espionage Act. So, so it's like, holy cow. But I'm about halfway through it. And... Man, I I recommend people listen to it or read it because it will open your eyes and kind of might lead people to challenge our approach, our government's approach and other governments' approaches to the question of nuclear armament. Because as an example, I'll, throw, I'll just throw one thing out there. So a former head of FEMA informs the author that FEMA's job is not actually to help people in a disaster. FEMA's job is to make sure that government still can operate in the midst of catastrophic events. So in the cases of nuclear war, FEMA would make, be making announcements that uh, find shelter, stay inside, self-survive. That the government is not going to be able to help you. And of course, if you're in a location that gets hit with a, a nuclear bomb or, nu- or missile, whatever, a warhead, you're going to be beyond help anyway. But it's like, man, wow. I'm listening, because I listen to audiobooks when I go to bed. And uh, I started listening to this. And that going right to sleep, that is for certain. Matthew Constantine says, the AI doesn't hate you. The AI doesn't love you. The AI only knows that you are made of atoms that it could use for something else. See, that's another thing with AI. I'm a little... Don't know. Plus, I don't like the fact that AI is, you know, hunting for everybody's jobs. Madman says, duck and cover for everything, including volcanic eruptions. Now, I remember as a kid in grammar school, we used to go down into the lunchroom, which was essentially in a, like the basement, because I went to a small Catholic school. And there were maybe... Oh, I don't know, 250 kids in the whole school. So we would go down there and we would practice uh, ducking and covering under the tables in case of a nuclear attack. It's like, okay. Of course, where Rush says, I'll start adding spikes to a set of shoulder pads. Yeah, make sure you get that really big Desert Eagle, too. All righty, everybody. Kev Reed is with us. I got to get my Twilight 2000 game out. If uh, 
any of you recall Morrow Project? Uh, Morrow Project was supposed to be that your team was cryogenically frozen and they were supposed to emerge. If I remember right, I think it's supposed to be 10 years after the nuclear war, which to be honest, everything would be absolutely radioactive still. Uh, but something goes wrong and they don't get awakened for like 150 years. But I remember in one of the editions, I think it was the first edition, there was actually information about where uh, nukes were targeted. I was like, geez. Chris Lundgren says, Terminator 3 scared them in the ending where John Carter was in the old government shelter and heard all the radio calls coming in begging for help. Highly recommend this. Plus, this just came out. So I started listening to the book and the attack takes place. So I started listening to it on the 29th and the attack takes place on March 30th, 2024. And I'm like, it's like I remember Halloween 3. Went to see Halloween 3, and it takes place. It starts off on October 24th, which is my birthday. <laughs> I remember sitting there in the theater with Elliot, and I'm like, and I think we went to see it on my birthday, which was like, oh, hey, look, because we saw it like opening night. And man, that movie sucked. <laughs> sucked hard. All right, everybody. So there you have my answer that no, I do not believe any current or something on the horizon, anything that we're aware of on the horizon as far as role-playing games can dethrone Dungeons and Dragons from the top spot. I just don't see it. It's all right, Silver Shamrock. Matthew Constantine points out, three more days till Halloween, 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 three more days till Halloween, Silver Shamrock. <laughs> I think the thing that pissed us off the most about that movie is how it left you hanging. It was like, really? And then, of course, Halloween 4 came out. It had nothing to do with that, so... All right, anyways, if you were watching live, thank you very much. If you watched live and took part in chat, tip of the cap to you, because not only are you keeping me company, you're keeping each other company as well. But of course, I know a lot of people out there, you don't have an opportunity to watch live. Doesn't matter if you're watching live or on Memorex. Thank you very much for taking time out to watch any of the videos here on the Gaming Gang channel. Of course, if you like this video, give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, don't forget, ring that bell. It will not only let you know when the Dispatch streams live Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. Central. It also lets you know when I upload other videos, such as my review of issues one through three of Cursed Scroll for the Shadow Dark role-playing game. Yep, unleashed that earlier today. And I liked them, liked them a lot. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more you are not going to find here on the channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Everybody enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time of day it is in your neck of the woods. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. I'll be back tomorrow. And here's hoping all of you always get to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang. <laughs>